from Hollywood, I'm Martin Grove, welcoming you to our Screen Dollars podcast, Box Office Autopsy. Right now, we'll look at the movie marketplace and analyze how things are going and where they're going sharing some opinions from my perspective after decades of talking about Hollywood on CNN Entertainment Tonight and as a Hollywood Reporter columnist. Exhibitors are talking about a great fall, but they don't mean the fall movie season, which looks anything but great. What they're referring to is the huge second weekend fall for Thor 4, a Marvel episode that's suffering from not really being plugged into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. This weekend also brought a new animated kids movie that was just limping along while the last animated blockbuster was running hard in its third weekend. And there's a new mystery thriller appealing mostly to younger women that opened better than expected, but not better enough to make this a great weekend. On today's box office autopsy, we'll focus on weekend two of Disney Marvel's Thor Love and Thunder, and we'll look at the openings of Sony's Where the Crawdads Sing and Paramount and Nickelodeon's Paws of Fury, The Legend of Hank. And then we'll check out the late summer and early fall movies, which look like they'll douse the box office heat for a few months. Later, we'll focus on Universal's horror thriller, Nope, opening next weekend, and we'll put our Oscar Outlook spotlight on how the Academy could get more than one TV bite out of its Oscar apple. But we start today with this quick look at Thor 4, which may explain why it didn't hold up very well. Day 62, intentions are running sky high on the set of Love and Thunder because his mood is at an all-time low. I'm about to go and help pick up the spirits with my bubbly, energetic personality. This is 10 years for me. I have loved every time I played the character. This new film transitions us from Endgame into a rebirth. Thor doesn't know what his place is in the universe. (laughs) That's represented in his wardrobe as well. I was really excited to come back as the mighty Thor and get to share the mantle. What are you wearing? I love it. (laughs) To have both of us in the same cape. (laughs) Um, That was amazing and incredible, especially with Taika at the helm. Taika, he's like a big kid. He's like sort of a genius child. I wasn't afraid to be flamboyant and a bit camp. Hi! Goats. Look at those! They are wonderful! Yes, they are. You also scream quite a lot. It's hugely imaginative and fun. It's such an enormous scale. It's a crazy space adventure with a new villain who's pretty monstrous. Oh, God, she won't die. We really raised the bar with Ragnarok. Love and Thunder is even more unique and different, so it's pretty exciting. Hollywood handicappers expected a 65% plunge for Thor 4 from last week's $144 million launch, but it wound up down 68% with $46 million at 4,375 theaters and a domestic cum of just over 233 million. It didn't help to have critics slamming it with 68% on Rotten Tomatoes and audiences giving it a blah 79%, down from 81% earlier in the week. 
As Marvel Weekend 2 slides go, it's up there with 68% for 2021's Black Widow, which was hurt by streaming day and date on Disney+, Plus, with 67% for the poorly reviewed Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness earlier this year, and with 68% for last December's Spider-Man No Way Home, which actually recovered very well after Christmas. Thor 4, which reportedly cost $250 million to make, is the Marvel Cinematic Universe's 29th title. The franchise's third episode, Thor Ragnarok, also from director Taika Waititi, fell 53.5% in its second weekend in theaters, with just over 57 million, after having opened to nearly 123 million. Ragnarok, which reportedly cost $180 million to produce, did just over $315 million domestic and about $854 million worldwide. It had the advantage of critics loving it with 93% on Rotten Tomatoes and an audience score of 87%. Thor 4 is looking better internationally, where it's done nearly $265 million in 47 markets, uh, no Russia or China there, bringing the global total to about $498 million. Sony and Hello Sunshine's PG-13 mystery thriller Where the Crawdads Sing opened third to 17 million at 3,560 theaters, better than the high end of Hollywood handicappers' projections for 10 to 15 million. It reportedly cost just 24 million to produce. Critics hated it with 37% on Rotten Tomatoes, but with an audience score of 96%, it should have favorable word of mouth. Based on Delia Owen's 2018 novel, which sold about 12 million copies, it stars Daisy Edgar Jones as a mysterious Marsh girl who becomes the top suspect in a murder case. Paramount and Nickelodeon's PG animated Paws of Fury the Legend of Hank opened sixth to just 6.3 million at 3,475 theaters, way below Hollywood handicappers' expectations for 12 to 15 million. Critics on RT hated it with 54%, and audiences were a miserable 67%. The good news for Paramount is that the studio reported we paid just $10 million to pick up Paws, and even this weak theatrical opening will give Paws enhanced value when it starts streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Let's pause here for this quick look at Paws. Huh? I'm Hank, and I'm the new Samurai. New Samurai, huh? Hank is a dog in a world of dog-hating cats. What the mother father cocker spaniel's going on here? Ah! Jimbo, played by Samuel L. Jackson, <laughs> becomes Hank's teacher. <laughs> Don't forget to land on your <laughs> feet. The movie is pretty wacky and pretty wild. Oh! And a lot of fun. It's Hank and Jimbo. We're here to save you. It was a blast to make this movie. <laughs> Lesson over. Well done. Focus Features, Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris, was going nowhere in ninth place, opening to a million seven at 980 theaters. The adult female appeal PG comedy drama is about a widowed cleaning lady, played by Leslie Manville, in 1950s London. She dreams of owning a Dior dress, and after managing to raise the money to buy it, goes to Paris for what movie marketers like to call the adventure of a lifetime. 
The movie is based on Paul Gallico's 1958 novel, Flowers for Mrs. Harris, which later became known as Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris, the first in a series of four Mrs. Harris novels. The Paris book became a television movie in 1992 starring Angela Lansbury. Here's a quick scene from the new Mrs. Harris to help you decide if you want to see it or go to Paris. But isn't the marvelous Mrs. H? I don't trust you, sake. <laughs> what can I get you, ladies? It's been a lucky week. Two port and lemon. Every week's lucky if you're a bookmaker. You're not wrong there, love. Two port and lemon, please. Of course, now I've got your company. I'm in clover. You think you get our company for one drink, Mr. Archie? <laughs> now, these two are a proper judge of character. They like you, Ada Harris. Why they stick with you if they're so smart? Why do you stick with her? Her so crabby. Met in my first shift building planes. Never had a better friend. Trouble with this one? She always speak the truth. Can't help herself. That is a terrible affliction. <laughs> Alright, behave yourself, ladies. I'll be watching you. Looking ahead. There's a box office bump heading our way next weekend, thanks to Universal's R-rated sci-fi horror thriller, Nope, from Jordan Peele, who directed the horror hits Us in 2019 and Get Out in 2017. With no other wide openings to get in Nope's way, exhibs are buzzing about a $50 million opening. Media analysts, however, are much more exuberant, with 60 to 65 million. Here's a quick catch-up on Nope to let you know if it's a must-see movie. My films are always personal. Nope stands apart from my other films in that it's a bigger adventure than I've ever tried to tell. From a filmmaking perspective, by far my most ambitious. Action! What's a bad miracle? They got a word for that. I purposely wrote something without any regard to how possible it was. All right, pictures up. Here we go. Thankfully, the great Hoyte von Hoytema, one of the best cinematographers and the mastermind behind some of my favorite films and favorite imagery, responded to the script and the challenges. <laughs> It was a very exhilarating ride. Always creative, fun, never scared, and always pushing. In the scope of what we could do, this is made for a big screen. We shot on IMAX cameras, and we were not shy of doing very extreme or crazy things with those cameras. When you're shooting on IMAX, you just know you're doing something cinematically special. The image is so overwhelming. It feels like you're there. I wanted immersion. A awe and a fear and a wonder we all had when we were kids. Yeah, nah, nah, nah. Run! As for what it's about, Nope's plot is being kept quite secret. But what we're hearing is that UFOs and aliens are part of a chilling discovery made at a California ranch. Nope's top first choice demo is younger women who are four points over norm. Its average first choice score at this point is Two points over norm. There's no Rotten Tomatoes score yet, but critics like Jordan Peele. Get Out had a sizzling 98% from RT critics in 2017. Get Out reportedly cost just four and a half million dollars to produce. It opened from Universal February 24th, 2017 to 33.4 million dollars and did nearly $256 million worldwide. Us, which reportedly cost $20 million to produce, opened from Universal March 22, 2019, to just over $71 million, and did 
just over 255 million globally. It had a 93% critic score on RT. With Nope, Peel's budget is said to be just under $40 million. It stars Daniel Kaluuya, who also starred in Get Out, and in 2021 won the Best Supporting Actor Oscar, BAFTA, Golden Globe, and SAG Award for his performance in Warner Brothers and Braun Studios' biodrama Judas and the Black Messiah. Nope is clearly a top-of-the-line horror thriller from a critically acclaimed director with an Oscar-winning star. It's nothing like the parade of anonymous thrillers that will be marching down multiplex aisles this fall when tentpoles are on vacation. The question that comes to mind here is, could California's drought also be pinching Hollywood's fall movie pipeline? The trickle of product flowing into theaters this fall leaves no doubt that the studios are suddenly hitting the pause button on exhibitions recovery. What's missing from mid-August, after Sony's bullet train opens August 5th, through mid-October, before Universal's Halloween Ends opens October 14th, are the event films that brought moviegoers back to theaters. What will be playing is an unofficial festival of original thrillers and action films like Lionsgate's Fall, August 12th, Universal's Beast, August 19th, Sony and Screen Gems The Invitation, August 26th, Searchlight Pictures Barbarian, September 9th, Sony and Tristars The Woman King, September 16th, Warner Brothers and New Lines Don't Worry Darling, September 23rd, and Paramount Smile, September 30th. Missing from that horror collection, unfortunately, is Warner Brothers and New Lines Salem's Lot, which was set for September 9th and had lots of box office potential, but now won't hit theaters until next April 21st. Salem's director Gary Doberman co-wrote It, which opens September 8, 2017, to 123.4 million, and did nearly 702 million worldwide. He also directed Annabelle Comes Home, which opened June 26, 2019, to 20.3 million, and did a little over 231 million worldwide. Like It, Salem's has strong marketability from being based on a Stephen King novel. Moving Salem's to next spring isn't good news for exhibitors, but at least they now have something else to look forward to. And speaking of things to look forward to, it's time to crank up our Oscar Outlook Spotlight and see how the Academy could get more out of its Oscar franchise. Since franchises are the name of the game in Hollywood, one wonders, why isn't the Academy growing its Oscar brand? Instead of having just one overlong telecast that ends an overlong awards season and whose ratings have been eroding for years, the Academy should find a way to get more than one TV bite out of its Oscar apple. The low-hanging fruit here is the Oscar nominations. The Academy reveals them in a lifeless live announcement at 5 a.m. Pacific Time to accommodate the New York-based breakfast TV shows. It's a wasted opportunity to start the Oscar ball rolling with energy and excitement. Noms should be unveiled in a primetime one-hour special on ABC with a parade of A-list names opening sealed envelopes to tell viewers who got into every race. This would be the perfect time to play short scenes, not trailers, which are ads, from each of the ten Best Picture nominees to begin making viewers aware of who's competing. Perhaps they'll even buy tickets to see some of them. By wasting the Oscar noms opportunity, the Academy is also giving up a chance to earn additional ad revenue. 
ABC could create a premium price combo package to put big brands on both the Oscar noms and Oscar night telecasts. And if they want to, they can throw box office autopsy into that package, too. That's it for today's podcast. We'll be back next week here on Box Office Autopsy to see how Nope opens, and we'll also be keeping an eye on what's making news on the awards front in our Oscar Outlook feature. So please join us again then, and for now, thanks very much for listening. Time now for our film flashback look at what was happening in Hollywood right around now, way back then. Let's set today's time travel dial for... July 13th, 1978. Films that seem to have everything going for them don't always get to where they're going. As was the case with Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which premiered in New York July 13th, 1978. The film was loosely based on the 1974 off-Broadway production Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band on the Road, directed by Tom O'Horgan, who had staged the Broadway mega-hits Hair and Jesus Christ Superstar. His adaptation of the Beatles' legendary album was buried by the critics and closed after 66 performances. Nonetheless, Robert Stigwood, who'd already produced the blockbusters Saturday Night Fever, 1977, and Grease, 1978, thought he'd have another hit with Peppers, even though the Beatles themselves weren't involved. But Stigwood thought wrong. Peppers cost $20 million to produce and only gross $20.4 million. Critics on Rotten Tomatoes hated it with 11%, and audiences were just 44%. Pepper's all-star cast included the Bee Gees, Barry Robin and Morris Gibb, Peter Frampton, Steve Martin, Aerosmith, Alice Cooper, George Burns, and Billy Preston. Preston was the only one in the film who'd worked with the Beatles, playing piano on their classic 1967 LP. The long list of actors and singers who reportedly said no to Peppers includes Elton John, Olivia Newton-John, Donna Summer, Bob Hope, Rock Hudson, Doris Day, Barry Manilow, and Andy Gibb for the Billy Shears role that went to Frampton. Chris Beard, a veteran TV director, was originally to direct, but was dropped by Stigwood before shooting began. When Stigwood asked Michael Schultz, who directed Which Way is Up, to come on board, Schultz was about to pass, but recalled turning down Stigwood's last offer to direct Grease, which Randall Kleiser, director of The Blue Lagoon, then made for $6 million, it did over 396 million worldwide. After two weeks of filming, the Bee Gees tried but failed to get released from Peppers, despite their having previously done the highly acclaimed soundtrack for Stigwood's Saturday Night Fever. They later claimed Peppers hurt their popularity because critics accused them of trying to imitate the Beatles. As for the Fab Four, when Peppers premiered, only Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr attended. In an interview years later, George Harrison was asked about Frampton and the Bee Gees being in the movie, and replied, I think it's damaged their images, their careers, and they didn't need to do that. It's just like the Beatles trying to do the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones can do it better. That's it for today's podcast. Thanks for listening. 
We'll be back with another box office autopsy next week. In Hollywood for Screen Dollars, I'm Martin Grove.